few traditions are as important to American males as the annual hunting trip. And Tom Messick's hunting posse was no different until November 15th, 2015, when Tom would vanish from the hunt, never to be seen again. Welcome to The In-Between. I'm Carol Ann, and today we are exploring how a man who can't really go anywhere on his own can seemingly vanish literally without a trace. This is the confounding story of Thomas Messick. In the early 1960s, Tom and his friends Sid, Al, and Joe got together to go on a hunting trip together. Little did they know, this was the start of an annual tradition that would span 55 years. These guys were so tight that they even went in together to buy a hunting lodge as a home base for their yearly expedition. Now, Tom was about as all-American as they come. After starting his adult life as a paratrooper for the 82nd Airborne in the 1950s, he settled down around Troy, New York, married his sweetheart Beverly in 1959, and had three sons. By the time the annual hunting trip came around in 2015, he and Beverly had already passed their 56th wedding anniversary. But the years were certainly starting to catch up with Tom. When he was in his 20s, he had an accident with some gunpowder that left him with 159 stitches in his hand and a blind eye. Not a huge deal, but by 2015, Tom is now 82 years old and the eyesight in the remaining eye wasn't so good anymore. Neither was his hearing, and neither was his heart. But he can still get around reasonably well, and with the help of family and friends, he's able to do pretty much everything he's always done. But right before the 2015 hunting trip, he comes down with shingles and seriously thinks about not going on the trip. But when the time comes... He's, he decides he's recovered enough and feels pretty good. So he goes on the hunting trip like he has every fall for 55 years. And it's not like they're out camping in the woods. I mean, they have this nice cabin to stay in and his son's going to be there too. And this year, there are seven people total in their group, which includes his son, Rob. They load up sometime in early November hit the road for the 70-mile trip north from Troy, New York, to the cabin, which is around Hag, New York. Sunday, November 15th, Sid tells the group that he heard about some state hunting land not far from them around Lily Pond that doesn't see a lot of traffic. It's not that far, it's just a few miles down the road, so maybe they should head on over there for the afternoon and see if they can find some deer. Easy peasy. So that's what they do. They hop in their cars and head on over. It's about noon when they get there and the boys have a plan. Since four of the seven hunters are of advanced age, the younger members set up a drive, which is a pretty common hunting tactic. The idea is that the older folks station themselves about 150 feet in from the road and about 300 feet from each other in a line. They're the watchers. Then the three younger guys walk around in a wide path and they circle back in the direction of the watchers with the idea that they drive any deer ahead of them as they go right to the watchers. Fish in a barrel. This allows the older guys, all in their 80s, to sit while the younger ones expend all the energy. So, the old guys walk into the woods to take up their positions. Tom was the last one in the line of four and the furthest away from their cars. But one of the younger guys in the group walked him to his spot. The plan is to either shoot some deer or if they don't see any deer, they meet back at the cars around two o'clock. Tom walked into those woods wearing a green camel coat and pants and his decades-old red and black checked hat sitting squarely on his head. He carried a 30-30 shotgun with extra rounds and a walkie-talkie. In fact, they all had walkie-talkies all set to the same channel. Not seeing any deer, or any other wildlife for that matter, when 2 p.m. rolls around, everyone meets back at the cars, except Tom. 
They call him on the walkie-talkie. No response. Two of the guys walk over to where they had left him, and he's nowhere around. So they start fanning out to look for him. Couldn't have gotten far, and even though all he had to do was pretty much stand up and turn around to see the road behind him where they came from, well, maybe he just got a little mixed up and headed in the wrong direction. But they can't find anything. They even fire three shots in the air, which is like the universal hunting signal for trouble. But they hear no shots in return. And it doesn't take long for the men to realize that they have a real problem on their hands. So one of them heads into town to alert the DNR or the Department of Natural Resources that they have a missing hunter. And by 4.30 that afternoon, rangers are on the scene organizing a search. By 7.30 p.m., it's dark out, and searchers drive trucks with all their lights on up and down the service road that leads to Lily Pond, honking their horns to try to show Tom the way. Nothing. Rob, Tom's son, calls his mom and lets her know, hey, dad's missing, but don't worry, we'll find him soon. Beverly's response, I'm on my way. But that's what everyone thought, we'll find him soon. This should be such an easy search. Tom can't go very far on his own. And if he did wander off and get lost, well, he had been teaching hunting and survival skills for years. So he should be able to take care of himself until searchers can find him. But they don't find him. And even the DNR officers are perplexed. They assume that since they're looking for a man in his 80s, this is gonna be a quick search. Either he wandered away, in which case he can't go very far, very fast, or they're going to find him dead due to some medical event. After a quick initial search that turns up nothing, they know something's not right and call for reinforcements. Over 50 agencies and upwards of 300 people a day show up to search for Tom. And authorities pull out all the stops. They had people dogs, divers, helicopters equipped with FLIR, you name it. The search was so big that locals were wondering if this was some politician's nephew or something. Gotta be somebody important. Interestingly enough, on the fifth day of the search, two FBI agents who were with the New York Police Special Operations Response Team, they show up. Huh. It doesn't happen very often. Feds usually only show up when there is suspicion of a crime that happened on federal land or when their assistance is requested. But none of the authorities running Tom's search ask for their help. Tom's wife, Beverly, says, basically, they were there to tell me that he he's now considered a missing person and they felt that something was definitely not right. But unless and until they made a recovery, they wouldn't know what it was. The people on the ground set up a grid search where they pick a section, draw lines on either end, those are called bump lines, and then go through sections, basically shoulder to shoulder, looking for anything. Once the line of searchers has gone from one bump line to the other, the area is cordoned off with string so they know it's been searched and everybody moves to the next section. Searchers say they went over some sections so many times that the forest looked like a big spider web of strings. Hampered by heavy rain on many of the search days, they eventually cover over four square miles of forest this way and many more by air. And the bloodhounds that authorities brought in to track Tom, they couldn't pick up a scent at all. The official search ends 11 days later on Thanksgiving Day, November 26th. And that was the day that Beverly, who had never left the command post the entire time the search was happening, decides it's time for her to go home. People continue to search, though, eventually covering over 8,000 acres or over 12 square miles from the spot where Tom was last seen. And they even check all of the areas surrounding ponds and lakes and caves and any other areas that should have been inaccessible. No trace 
of Tom is ever found. No bones, no clothes, no walkie-talkie, not even his gun. So what the hell happened to Tom? Well, let's look at some of the options. As much as I hate to say it, hunting accidents happen all the time. But these guys knew their gun safety rules inside and out. And all of the older guys were sitting in a line with the others off to their left or their right, looking straight ahead at the hill in front of them, because that's where the deer should be coming from. It's not likely that one of them turned a full 90 degrees to one side or the other to accidentally shoot Tom. Or maybe there was an accidental discharge at some other point. Doesn't matter. Why would anyone hide an accident? And even if you did, it'd be pretty tough to get everyone to go along with the story and even tougher for all of them to fool the New York Bureau of Criminal Investigation or BCI. Obviously, the first questions go to the other six people who were with him. They're all questioned by the New York BCI investigators who find no reason to suspect any of them of anything. But let's stay on the subject of foul play for a moment. If none of Tom's hunting buddies have anything to do with Tom's being missing, what about somebody else? Beverly says the only other reason she can think of that Tom would disappear is that maybe somebody else came in on a four-wheeler or something and just took him. But this theory doesn't really work. Remember that the four watchers are all seated just a couple hundred feet away from each other and only about 150 feet from the road, more than close enough to hear each other if someone called for help. Keep in mind, this was in November, so most of the leaves had fallen from the trees, making any sounds even easier to hear. So if someone were to drive in there, either in a car or a four-wheeler, someone would have heard it. And assuming they could silently incapacitate Tom, they would still have to drag him back to either a car or a four-wheeler without making a sound. Not likely. There's also an interesting idea that maybe Tom was never in those woods, that something else happened to him somewhere else, and his buddies made up the hunting story to cover their tracks. Well, considering the complete lack of anything in the woods where he supposedly sat for two hours, this, on its face, sounds plausible. But then again, why? Tom didn't have any real money to speak of, and everybody loved the guy. So there's no real motive to get rid of him. And if it wasn't murder, just some kind of accident, why cover it up? Is it possible that Tom was attacked by an animal? Maybe. Half of New York State's population of black bears live in Adirondack State Park, and where Tom and his crew were hunting is inside the eastern border of that park. But black bears tend to shy away from people and wouldn't be likely to attack somebody who's just sitting there minding his own business. What about mountain lions? Well, again, possible. The New York Department of Environmental Conservation, or DEC, says there are no mountain lions in New York, but there are plenty of eyewitnesses who will tell you otherwise. But the problem with this theory is the same as the foul play theory. Somebody would have heard something. Most people generally don't stay silent when being attacked by an animal. Not to mention that even if we say, okay, he was attacked and then dragged away somewhere his gun would still be left at the scene. And wherever this animal dragged him to, to eat him, wouldn't be all that far. A predator is not going to drag its prey for five miles. So wherever that predator stopped to enjoy its dinner, there would be remains left over, including a lot of blood. It's pretty rare that not a single bone is left not to mention clothing and a walkie-talkie with an animal attack. But none of these things are ever found. It is not necessarily uncommon for a person to want to leave this world 
on their own terms. So the idea has been floated that maybe Tom's declining health led him to make the decision that he was done here and wanted to move on to the next plane of existence. But no one ever mentions anything about Tom being depressed or suicidal. In fact, with the help and encouragement of his friends and family, he was still doing pretty much everything he wanted to do. And he didn't just walk off into the woods by himself. He couldn't have gotten far enough for searchers to not find him. So that would mean he would have to convince at least one of his friends to go along with this plan. And I could see maybe one of his three lifelong friends going along with it, maybe staging a hunting accident. But there wasn't a hunting accident. There's no body. So this plan would have then necessitated someone hiding Tom's body. But his closest friends, they're all in their 80s as well. So they're in no condition to be dragging a body around in the forest, which means that you would have had to convince one of the younger guys. However, the younger guys are probably a lot less likely to go along with this plan, especially Tom's son, Rob. Not to mention that if this were the plan, why would you pick a plan where you had to hide a body? Why not just stage a hunting accident? So if we've run out of the normal explanations, that leaves us with the not so normal explanations. In this case it does have some unexplainable elements to it. First and foremost, the fact that neither Tom's body nor anything else he brought with him was ever found, it's pretty abnormal right there. Most people do not disappear literally without a trace. But there's more. Remember when I mentioned earlier that not only did the men not see any deer that day, but they didn't see anything else either? No wildlife at all. Now again, this is November, so all kinds of animals, from squirrels to chipmunks to birds, should have been scurrying around, getting ready for the winter months ahead. Those woods should have been teeming with activity, but none of them saw or heard anything. It's not just the guys in the hunting party that mentioned the lack of life in the woods, but the searchers do too, with several of them noting the strange quiet in the area. And this is interesting to me because whether we're talking about an ordinary predator or a cryptid of some kind, it's common for the animals in the area to make themselves scarce to hopefully stay off said predator's lunch menu. But once that threat is gone, Life usually returns to normal. So for both the hunting party and the searchers to mention the same eerie stillness, that means that stillness remains for at least a couple of days. That's weird. Also, Sid said he heard a strange noise, a noise that he says that he's never heard before in his 55 years of being an outdoorsman. He said it sounded like it came from in front of them from the hill about 150 feet or so. He said it was quick and, and that it's really hard to describe, but that it kind of sounded um, metallic, uh, maybe like the sound of a trap closing. He thought it was odd and out of place enough to mention it to the police when they interviewed him. When asked whether or not investigators ever followed up on that detail, Sid said, yeah, I told them that, but they just passed it off, you know? But to me, what might be the biggest red flag is the lack of noise coming from Tom. The Lore Lodge did a documentary on this case called Into Thin Air, where they went to the area and ran a quick little experiment on how far noise can travel in those woods. And I'll put a link to that video in the description. What did they find out? Even at the height of summer, with tons of leaves around to deaden the sound, at a distance of 300 feet away from each other, they are still able to hear each other when talking barely above their regular conversation levels. So any noise Tom made would most likely have been heard 
if not by everyone, at least by Joe, the one closest to Tom. But nobody heard a thing. Another side facet to the strangeness of this case is that on day 10 of the search for Tom, some of the DEC rangers are pulled off of this search and sent about 40 miles south to Schulerville to search for another missing man, Fred or Fritz Drum. Fritz, who's 68, and his wife live on 170 acres of land. And on the morning of Tuesday, November 24th, Fritz's wife is out at a breakfast meeting and comes home to an empty house. Fritz's car is still in the driveway, so she figures he must have just gone for a walk. But he never comes home. And no trace of Fritz is ever found either. So what are the chances of two older men, both familiar with the forest, disappearing only 40 miles apart from one another and only 10 days apart? In my opinion, astronomical. So what are we left with? Well, not much, except Willie, Tom's yellow lab, who at least as of 2019, was still sitting in the kitchen window every day, waiting for his best friend Tom to come home. This case is just so bizarre. And I try to look at things objectively. Um, the Missing Enigma has a great video that features three cases of people who vanished into thin air, but were eventually found with unusual but completely natural explanations for their deaths. I'll put a link in the description if you want to check that out. But if you want to check out another case that's eerily similar to this one and just as baffling, check out this video right here. Be careful out there and I will see you here again on The In-Between. <laughs>